as you can see, I've set up a little bit of a studio here. Did a, did a bit of experimenting with the lighting. Of course, I've got this camera here shooting directly onto the other, the participant, the interviewee, um, because I don't want to pay for the pro version of Zoom. Uh, but I need 1080p footage, so this way I record it straight off the big screen. I'll get my 1080p, I've got my mic just above here, got another mic here, another one on camera B, and here comes Hicks Tangent now. Let's put him in the room. Yeah, sure. So um, my name's Emmanuel. Uh, in the Hex community, I go by the name Tangent. And uh, I consider myself to be a Bitcoin OG, provably by businesses that are registered in my name from back when, around that early, early Bitcoin time, and also being a Mt. Gox creditor. So it's sort of, um, I guess, provable. And <clears throat> Hex was one of those things where I was of, I was deeply immersed into the crypto space from probably um, after a break. So I'll, I'll go back to basically, so we, I was in crypto in 2012. And then when Mt. Gox failed and took everyone's Bitcoin or, or it was unable to get Bitcoin, I sort of rage quit out of the space and had a gap there came back into crypto in early 2015 and was deeply involved from there onwards. So there weren't many things within the crypto space that were escaping me through, through that period. And so I was aware of Richard Hart and I was aware of his intention to launch a project from well before Hex actually became available. So, so I was in Hex from the very first day. Yeah, because Richard's been around a long while, right? That's right. Yeah. He claims, he claims to have, sorry to interrupt. Um, he claims to have mined uh, full Bitcoin blocks using a CPU back when you could do that. And that would mean that he would have had to have been in from very early. Yeah. Right. Okay. So take us back to that moment that for, that you first heard of Hex. When, when was that? Would that, would that have been 20, 2019 or was he talking about it earlier it was called bitcoin hex right so if, if there's actually one step further back than that he was thinking about launching something called cfd token so uh it was a fluid dynamics token with the intention of being that it would be a useful proof of work so rather than the proof of work mining being wasted that it would be, uh, there would be a dual benefit. One would be to secure the chain and the other benefit would be they would actually be doing fluid dynamics calculations for modeling software for all sorts of, you know, fluid dynamics that impacts everything, all sorts of, all sorts of designs for cars, rockets, pipelines, etc. So um, that sounded really good and I would have gone in on that project as well. And then at some point he pivoted into the idea of HEX which, as you correctly pointed out, was originally named Bitcoin Hex. But then for several reasons, the term Bitcoin was removed from the name, which I think was a good idea. He primarily removed it because people were accusing him of trying to steal or, or piggyback on the brand of Bitcoin. So he decided by removing it, he stops that accusation and makes it a better brand in the same process. Yeah, right. Okay. I've, I've heard similar responses in regards to the, the use of uh, Bitcoin at the beginning. I think it worked out. It seems to have worked out well. Um, I agree. So in your opinion, do all crypto scams boil down to whether they have a king or not, whether they are decentralized or not? Yeah, it's scam is such a broad definition. And for me, it comes down to intention. So if the person, in, if the people involved in the project are intending to uh, harm others for their own financial benefit, then that becomes a scam. So that's fairly broad in the sense that it doesn't, um, it's, it's not a technical definition. It's more of a, a, a human definition. Okay. So decentralization or not doesn't really play a role. It, it helps decentralization helps in the sense that it 
limits the avenues at, by which someone can scam. <clears throat> because if something is centralized, then those entities that have control uh, are able to scam more than a, than a system that is decentralized. But, but, but it doesn't necessarily mean that something that is decentralized is not a scam or that something that is centralized is a scam. Precisely. So um, I, I, I assume you've been seeing my posts on Twitter. I'm having a little bit of an yes. issue getting hold of people that will speak on the opposing side to, to Hex and, you know, those ones. They're very vocal about calling it a scam, but they won't go into any further details there. So I assume what they are ref referring to, and it's why I asked the question, is it can it be proven to not be possible? I mean, you can never know someone's intentions. Of course, Richard has built something quite epic here, it appears, and doesn't, to my in my mind, make sense that he would do this rug pull thing that people talk about and fuck the whole thing up doesn't make sense. And so what do you think is that thing that they miss when they, in, you know, in, 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 instinctively call it a scam? I, I think it is difficult, if not impossible, to prove 100% that something is or isn't a scam. So we're always within this gray area, not knowing for sure, even with something like Bitcoin, we don't know, we can't prove uh, with 100% certainty that it is not a scam. Um, and so I think the reason you've had difficulty getting people to come forward and express what they don't like about HEX or why they believe HEX is a scam is because they haven't done deep enough research into it to even be able to mount an argument uh, concisely and effectively against HEX. And I believe that people within the HEX community, particularly someone like Richard, would actually be best placed to give you the argument for why it's not perfect, sort of to highlight the imperfections or, or things that are less than ideal. So I believe I would actually be a better um, candidate for highlighting the things that are not perfect in HEX than, say, one of these people who scream scam on the... Um, on Twitter and that sort of thing, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you you mentioned that in your in your in a in your Twitter DM to me. So can you expand on that? You you wanted to talk a little bit more on that. So go ahead. I'll give you the floor. I guess there are aspects that people could point towards as being not not that not that say that hex is a scam, just elements that are not ideal for a crypto project. So <clears throat> it is true that an, an entity or multiple entities hold a large part of the supply of HEX. So that means that effectively there's an introduction of an element of trust that you're trusting. And, and remember that, that those coins are liquid, they're not staked, so that they could theoretically be sold. So you are introducing an element of trust that you are not trusting the entity or entities that hold those coins to dump. But for me personally, those issues are mitigated by game theoretical elements that in my opinion, show that it would not make sense for those entities to dump those coins. So it's, it's not ideal, but it is not as bad as some people will, would make out. I don't consider it to be an issue. Okay, touch on those game the theoretical elements that you, you just mentioned. Can you expand there? So I guess if you take the, if we take the origin address and assume that it's a single entity, that entity would be, <clears throat> sort of self it would be a self-defeating move to go and dump the um dump the price using the supply of coins that it holds now you might ask well why do we see that happening in a range of other cryptocurrencies why if, if that's the case that the that the owners or founders or sort of um majority holders if, if there's a if there's a game theoretical 
uh, incentive for them to not dump, why do we see it so much in these other coins? And my answer to that is that when you have multiple founders or multiple large scale um, holders, effectively there becomes a new set of game theory where those guys have to get paranoid about whether one of the other people will dump. And when they start to think, oh, if the other person dumps, then, then I'm going to basically be left holding a bag of worthless tokens, someone eventually caves. So by having a single entity that is the majority coin holder, they only have to trust themselves. So the game theory is subtly different. And I think that's a big difference between Hex and other coin projects where we've seen they just get they just get dumped by the founders dumped and the coin price you see the chart it's just it's just death forever right okay and it sounds like what you're describing then is a there is a type of i i was forwarded some links to a reddit threads and there was the mention of something called a gnosis wallet or a gnosis Safe. Essentially, it allows you to do multi multi signatures for many parties, um, for one wallet. So, it's, so wow. that so that you can avoid exactly what you describe with pa this paranoia amongst the founders. Everybody has to sign off on everything; otherwise, there is no transaction. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually not super familiar with that because of the fact that I haven't required it for my own personal situation. However, I will mention that with multi-sig, on the surface, it appears to be something that is very good and, and it can be good if, it's, if it is used correctly. However, as an independent third party who's looking at the system, you can't tell if those multi-signature, the, the signatories, the, the key holders are actually multiple different people or all the same guy. So because of the pseudo anonymity within crypto, um, it still doesn't mean that we end up with something that can be looked at externally and go, yep, that's sweet. It, it, it's, um, it's now safe to, to assume that, um, that no one person can dump the coins. So that's, so that's something a lot of people don't realize with multi-sig is that it's only as strong as um, you knowing for sure who holds the keys. And remember that, that multiple people can hold the keys. So even if three different people all signed messages to say, yes, I hold the keys, yes, I hold the keys, yes, I hold the keys, you still don't know if the third guy holds the other keys as well. You've only proven that those three people do have the keys. You haven't proven that one of them doesn't have all the keys. Yeah, right. Okay. I what is what is a god whale? Oh, well, um, so I guess that definition sprung up because there's a wallet that appears to be one of the early ETH uh, participants in the Ethereum, so involved in the original coin token offering of, of Ethereum. And so that entity appears to hold a lot of ETH and has been a, an active participant in HEX, buying a lot of HEX and staking a lot of HEX. And so people have just referred to that wallet address or group of wallet addresses as the God Whale. Okay. So they're, they're, sep they're independent from the, the origin address. Well, th there is an assumption that they are, but theoretically it could be the same entity. Okay. So, sorry, sorry, I'll just expand on that a little bit, that the reason that Richard claims that it is pr somewhat provable or there's evidence that it's not him is because if you agree, and you can tell by looking at the blockchain, that that person was in Ethereum right from the very, very, very early stages and went in large, and subsequent to that, Richard was trash talking Ethereum a lot, saying that it was no good. And so if you, if you work under the assumption that no one would um, thrash their, like, trash something that they've got such a large bag of, again, a, a sort of a game theoretical element that you wouldn't trash talk your own bag, then you would assume that that God whale is not 
associated with the founding team, i.e. Richard and, and the origin address, etc. Okay. Yeah, that that just reminds me. There's a, often the the topic of conversation is this rug pull or this dumping or whatever you want to call it. It's like an event that's sudden and out of nowhere. But in reality, you know, if I were if I I just put myself in their position in in that in that position, I you know, you would slowly sort of dump small bags over a longer period, it, so as not to get any attention from the community so i don't know if there is evidence of that or if that's happened before in your mind or keeping in mind keeping in mind that because everything's on chain and there are a lot of people that are scrutinizing these transactions you can look and see that the origin address has never sold a single coin uh, and you can also see that I agree with you as well. And that comes back to single founder where there doesn't need to be this race to dump. One, one of the ways that um, one of the ways that you could argue that the origin address or addresses associated to the origin address are selling coins is anyone who provides liquidity on both sides means that when the price moves, that entity is buying and selling tokens. So <clears throat> while the on-chain shows that the origin address has never actively sold a coin as a as a um, sort of as a what's it called as a discrete move, you could argue that anyone that provides liquidity is buying and selling coins as the price moves. And so if we assume that liquidity has been provided by, and I, I'm not sure about that, we would need to go and look on chain to make sure of that, to see whether origin address or, or anyone associated to that has ever provided liquidity, then in that respect, coins get sold as the price goes up. <clears throat> However, I think that's acceptable because you are providing an important function to the community of having liquidity within the pool. You know, a lot of people argue that not enough liquidity has been provided to the pool. So, you know, people who don't like HEX, that's one of their criticisms is that there's not enough liquidity. So you can't have it both ways, obviously. Someone either needs to provide liquidity and that means that by necessity, coins are being bought and sold as the price moves, or you don't have the founding entity providing liquidity uh, and then is able to further say that absolutely no coins have ever been sold. Talk to me about Big Payday. Take me back to Big Payday. Were you around then? Yes, yeah, I was in Hex right from the start. Big Ta Big Payday was an interesting one. I it was one of those ones where I didn't necessarily agree with it before it happened. I thought I thought for me personally, I would have preferred Hex to have been a cleaner value proposition immediately from the start. In, in saying that, what I mean is nothing changes throughout the life of the project. So if there was going to be no referrals later in the track, you'd have no referrals at the start. Now, now if it had been done my way, the price appreciation, appreciation would have been nowhere near as good. So all of these things that I didn't agree with at the time turned out to be amazing for price. So looking back on it, I think that were great. But... I found it difficult to explain to people at the time saying, oh, you know, there's this and this and this element, but then later down the track, that's not going to exist anymore. There's this big payday, but it's this one-off event. And then after that, it's, but now we've moved past all that. And so now it is as clean as what I wanted or as clean as I like. So <clears throat> the big payday was uh, a single day where all the unclaimed coins from people able to do Bitcoin claims were paid out to all the people who were staked. And so those stakers came from people who free staked from claiming from Bitcoin and also from people who bought coins and staked them. So that's what Hex community refers to as the staker class. And they got paid out all the coins that were not claimed and i actually remember there was a bitcoin maximalist who when he was finding out about hex he was obviously upset that a 
Bitcoin was being launched that's not Bitcoin. And he was, you could see him thinking through it live and you could actually see that he, when he realized the way that that was going to occur, where those payout, those coins, if Bitcoiners did not claim them, that it was going to be paid to people who did, you could see that he realized that it was a genius maneuver to basically put Bitcoin maximalists into a position where you either claim and you're supporting the project by proxy, because obviously you can see on chain who signed the, the transactions to join the network to, or to be a participant or to get the free coins. But if they don't claim, then it goes to everyone else. So it sort of puts them in a tough position. Do they, do they claim it and then try and dump the coins to make the project go down and, or do they leave it and let those coins go to someone else? So uh, I thought that was quite amusing. Uh, what was what was the adoption amplifier? Was that related to Big Payday? Or was that something something else? They weren't directly associated, other than the Big Payday basically happened at the end of the adoption amplifier. So, the adoption amplifier really was just the name given to the EOS style launch of basically having uh, tokens available each day for a period of days. Uh, I can't remember how many it was for EOS, but for HEX, it was a full year. So it was 365 days where every day there was this uh, system where you effectively could contribute Ethereum into a pool. And then at the end of each day, you would get a pro rata amount of HEX. Now, the interesting difference between EOS and HEX, other than the fact that EOS was a shorter period, was... EOS was launched back in the ICO era where there were no effective DEXs. There were no DEXs that were reliable. I think DEXs, DEXs were around, but they were very, very poorly built and no one would really, no one was really using them. So when HEX was going through its adoption amplifier phase, there were already DEXs, which mean DEXs that means that people were able to actually buy and sell the token during that phase where it was still attempting to be launched. So where it was still being effectively on offer by the contract or by the entity that was launching the project, which made for an interesting, uh, an interesting scenario where you actually had people arbitraging between the on-chain swapping via the DEX and the adoption amplifier itself. And then people different people had different theories about which one was driving the other. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that, that is a peculiar scenario, isn't it? Mm -hmm. One of the accusations that was made was that ETH was being recycled by whoever had control over the adoption amplifier. So that effectively, and in, in theory, it could be done that Ethereum coming in to the, uh, into the pool could then be used by that entity at the end of the day and put back in again the next day. And that could just be done every day. But the thing that mitigates that accusation is the fact that a lot of this stuff can be verified on chain. And I believe that for both EOS and HEX, it was never able to be proven via, via on-chain analytics that recycling occurred right okay and there wasn't was there an airdrop for hex only the only if you count the bitcoin claims as an airdrop so it's not technically an airdrop really um maybe it's so again some of these definitions are a little bit subjective uh in terms of people people throw throw definitions around like scam airdrop uh, these sorts of things in lo loosely, I guess airdrop, I guess, means whenever you're being given coins for no economic input. Uh, and in, in which this case, this could class as an airdrop in terms of because all you're doing is you're signing to prove that you own Bitcoin and then receiving the hex tokens for free. I guess refer referrals also were given uh, tokens for free. I guess you could argue that was also a, a type of airdrop for referring okay 
Um, all right. I think you, I mean, you've touched on a lot of good stuff here, mate, really. Um, Thank you. You're, you're, so I guess I just, like, what I want to do is try to, i just wrap this up. I've got a couple more questions. I want to try to capture, if you can sort of, in layman's terms, simplify that, you know, you said you were a Bitcoin OG turned hexagon. I want to try to capture that that moment of change or, you know, that metamorphosis and that you went through that evolution, if you like. Like, just try to summarize that in a way that my, my grandma could understand. Um, well, first, I have to mention that I still do love Bitcoin. They're, they're basically my two favorite coins, Hex and Bitcoin. And I guess the things that I like about Hex come from my experience and the things that I like about Bitcoin. So no admin keys, no middlemen. So in simple terms, that means there isn't a third party that can take your asset away from you ever. There's no third party that can ever stop you transacting. It's censorship resistant value storage and transfer. Both Bitcoin and Hex have those properties. And then the reason I like Hex so much is because it adds a layer on top of that where you can achieve yield while still maintaining those core principles. You, most things in crypto that give yield require you to hand your asset over to someone else. And we have this saying in crypto, which is very important, not your keys, not your coins. It's, um, it's, that, it's that fundamental requirement that as soon as you hand something over to someone else, it's not yours anymore. All you have is a promise that they will give it back to you. And so the fact that with Hex, everything is done on chain. So, and, and to do, and with smart contracts. So you never hand your, you never hand your Hex over to anyone else for you to be able to generate yield from it. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that would be a simple way of explaining that I guess the moment the moment where I, the moment where I, so I guess there was no transitional moment for me where I flipped from loving Bitcoin to loving Hex more because I still love them both. Uh, but the moment that I decided that Hex was legit was watching Richard Hart's videos and having him explain it over and over and over again. And from my highly experienced position from being in Bitcoin for so long, I believe that I can tell when a project is, has elements of scamminess or, or things that I don't like or things that are deal breakers for me. And the more I heard about what he was planning to do, the more I realized that, that it did not contain elements that were deal breakers for me. And possibly the only thing that I wasn't 100% sold on was the fact that it was being built on top of Ethereum. So it was introducing a risk within the tech stack that if Ethereum failed or had some kind of problem, then Hex would also suffer from that problem. That was possibly the biggest thing for me. Um, and now with the launch of Pulse Chain, I wouldn't say that risk is completely removed, but it's certainly mitigated having a dual chain ecosystem. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to like about Hex. And I personally have not come across any deal breakers or any things that concern me in Hex that would stop me from holding it or stop me from buying more. Okay. Yeah, because <coughs> Richard Hart and Hex are you know, somewhat indivisible, really. You can't talk about one without the other. So just tell me a little bit, like you've been around a lot longer than some of the other guys I've uh, I've been interviewing with who, who, you know, on average have been in a couple of years through, primarily through Richard Hart's streaming. You've obviously seen him in action a little bit longer than those guys. So just talk on Richard a little bit. You know, he does have a bit of a background. Um, it's It's no secret. So, but just tell me what your overall view of, you know, of Richard is and if he went away, 
would what would Hex look like without him? It's a really good question. I agree that Richard has become a fundamental part of Hex that the community rallies around. Everyone really loves him and, um, you know, looks up to him and looks up to him. His, I would say his leadership in a, in a life sense, not necessarily to do with the project. I might sound biased, but I like him. He reminds me of several people throughout my life that have, in retrospect, been incredibly positive influences on me and have been wise beyond their years. One person in particular was a high school friend of mine and I saw characteristics and attributes in Richard that matched um, this friend of mine from high school. And so I immediately took a liking to Richard. The question of whether it would be a problem if he disappeared or say trash talk the project, not that he ever would, it's hard to say. There's, there's theories in both ways that I think sound reasonable. One theory is that without him, the project would fall over because there isn't this character for everyone to rally around. And the other theory is that if it could be proven that he is unable to dump the coins that people assume that he holds of the supply, then the supply would become incredibly limited. A, a bit like with how Satoshi's coins haven't moved. So people, some people assume that he is dead. And I think that's maybe a reasonable assumption. And so theoretically, a similar thing could happen for Hex. So I think there's argument, there's, uh, there's solid arguments in both directions. Right on. Okay, mate. Well, I think, is there anything else you want to just highlight that I might have missed? Um, I'll, I can give you, give you a couple of minutes to touch on anything you think I, you know, I should include. Um, well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to include it. Something that I really like, as I already mentioned, being in Bitcoin from so early I was never, ever, ever looking for any kind of respect or recognition from other Bitcoiners or people within the crypto space. And then along came Hex and the Hex community, and they really recognized my knowledge and my uh, skills and my experience with Bitcoin and crypto. And I never realized that it was something that would have been nice to have had from the broader crypto community and especially other Bitcoiners who knew that I'd been in the space for a long time. And so while I still don't chase any kind of, you know, uh, recognition for being an OG or anything like that, the Hex community really, they're, they're just such a positive community in, in my opinion. And I've just noticed that they, yeah, they just, they really, they really uplift everyone and focus on the positives of other people. And it's such an enthusiastic and talented community. There are so many people within that community that are just shockingly talented. And even though I'm deeply involved and look into things to do with Hex frequently, I'm constantly being uh, see, I'm constantly seeing things that are just sh surprising to me on how on how talented they are. I've got another five or six of these next week. I have um, I've got I've now found at least two opposition people of, uh, from okay. that are that are happy to come on record, but. Unfortunately, they don't want to show their faces, so that that's <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is sometimes. Maybe maybe we should have covered more items of. I guess I guess I don't really have a lot of bad stuff. Like I don't really have a lot of. Um, I guess like I, I'm not sure if I said this specifically, but in in the sense that 
in some ways, Richard, by having such a large amount of supply, has reintroduced it, uh, introduced a trust element in a system that is supposed to be a fundamental part of it is trustlessness. So that I think that's probably the, the best accusation that anyone can make against Hex is that is that. And, and like I said, the game theory then comes along and that's one of the so most I'd be interested I'd be interested to hear what these people say, the ones that say that it's a scam or that it's a problem. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, if they're capable they, they of want to, they want to make remain completely anonymous. Yeah, so far, I mean, like I'm I'm committed for 365 days. That's how long my stake is. So, I'll be you know, I'll be this film will be ready when my you know, when my stake ends, but um so I got plenty of time to find more people, but the few that I have found that have agreed to talk to me don't want to to be seen on camera. So, whatever, I'll just sure. you know, I'll take the information and if they're capable of a good argument, but like you just mentioned, if 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 there's if the the tr if he's if if Richard has reintroduced the trust element, he's you know from what I've seen over the last few years, he's not the only one. You know. Oh yeah, no. Everything else, <laughs> everything else in DeFi is basically um, trusted. It's it's there's a there's a massive even worse. Exactly, and so why does it get to market itself as DeFi decentralized, right? When it's mm. clearly centralized, still the, like, ter the term we use is Dino, um, decentralized in name only. Okay, Dino. I'll have to remember dino. that. Decentralized in name only. <laughs> in, in fact, that was another. That was another thing that I wanted to mention to you was that that time element. So, um, in fact, what I'll do is yeah. So, so basically, <clears throat> you know how one of the things that I think is important to note is that as time goes on, I think that's the best indication of hex not being a scam is the amount of time that's passed without it being a rug pull. So, you know, people say, so it's, and that, there's that Lindy effect that the longer something has been around for, the longer it's likely to be around for. So that's, that's one thing that Bitcoin has got over hex is it's been around longer. So it's the Lindy principle or whatever would imply that it's, going to stick around longer. Whereas um, with Hex, obviously the time's shorter, but still it's it's been, what, two and a half years now or something like that? I think it's been two and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I think the real test for Hex will be um, going through a bear market. So once we move through an entire bear market that and come out the other side and go into another bull, I think at that point, someone within the Hex community will have the right to say, we have shown that this is not a scam and is not going away. Until that point, I think it's a little bit premature because it's only ever existed in a bull market, which means things can survive um, without necessarily having the, uh, the, the staying power. 